Okay, so welcome. This is the uh, much talked about medical device, cybersecurity, cyber safety talk. Um, we're gonna have uh, a few people come up here and, and do things like we did in the last one. Um, but I wanna first kinda make a link to what happened last year. So if, anybody, if I show hands, just who was in the room last year when we were doing these talks and specifically in the medical device talk? I was. Somebody in the very back was, and it was just two people. I thought there were more, but maybe there weren't. Uh, so I want to kind of tie some of those things off and follow up on some of the things we talked about last year, some very cool, surprising developments. Uh, and then over the past year, more and more things have happened. So uh, unravel what those are, uh, and then looking ahead, what's coming up. Um, and then we're going to get four very, very cool people up on stage. Uh, we're going to have Jay Radcliffe. Um, who is a security researcher. Most of you know him. If not, you know his name at least. Uh, Suzanne Schwartz, who has already talked to us once today. She'll come back and talk again. Um, Colin Morgan, who is with Johnson & Johnson. He's done some really, really good things to help drive cybersecurity into their processes. Uh, and then Christian Damath, who is a uh, rare unicorn. He is both a DEF CON speaker and a registered physician. So he's one of the very few people that I know who have both of those on their title. So what's gone on in the last year? Um, specifically, following up from some of the things we heard last year. Well, I want to point out that as of last year uh, and before, this has not changed. Um, the FDA does not have to recertify patches for medical devices before they can be deployed in the field. Unless something changed this morning in the last hour? No. Okay. <laughs> So this is still accurate and up-to-date information. You don't have to worry about that. Uh, and there's the, the standard there that you can go and look it up for yourself if you don't believe it. Uh, I know that a lot of um, people falsely believe that you need, to have the uh, you need to have the FDA recertify your medical device before it's published, uh, before it uh, can be updated. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to follow up, too, on something that happened last year, we had uh, Draeger, who's a German medical device maker, um, announce their commitment to a coordinated vulnerability disclosure for the first time at B-Sides Las Vegas, which is a pretty cool thing, you know. A major medical, hoo hoo, yes. A major medical device maker came to us and said, we want to announce in your track first. And that was really, really cool. So since then, uh, about a year on, uh, they actually got the, uh, the thing up about a week or two later. Uh, a year on, they've had four vulnerability disclosures through this process. Um, so where a lot of medical device makers say, we can't do a coordinated vulnerability disclosure process because we don't, won't know what to do with all the vulnerabilities, um, they've gotten four, uh, which is not an onslaught. Uh, it's not overwhelming. Zero of these have been extortion attempts. Um, so contrary to the seemingly popular belief in some sectors that all researchers want to do is uh, try and get money out of you. That's not the case. Um, I'll also point out that they have about 12 hour turnaround time from when they get a report coming in to when the researcher gets a report uh, notification back, hey, we got this, we're looking into it. Thanks for sending it in, that's really cool. So uh, of all the software companies, how many have a 12 hour uh, turnaround time to that notification, human-based notification? Not many. So to the medical device makers and to the others who say, well, we just can't do that. We can't respond within 72 hours. Well, they're doing it within 12 hours, and that's with a, a team of very dedicated professionals um, working very hard to get that done. So it is possible. Uh, and Draeger's done great things. So um, they're probably watching right now. If they're not watching now, they'll watch the recording. So how about a round of applause for Draeger? I also want to follow up quickly on the Hospira situation. So well, we talked earlier today about Hospira. Um, they had a, a medical device, uh, an infusion pump that was, um, it's like a, a new fashion, newfangled IV. Uh, it's a computer controlled uh, system to, to inject medicine into the patients. Um, some security researchers found a vulnerability. They reported it quietly uh, in closed dialogue and then somebody reported it openly. Uh, that triggered a couple of things. First of all, uh, a safety notification went out in 
uh, May, I think it was May 13 of 2015, saying that the PCA3, PCA5 devices had this flaw and uh, for uh, healthcare organizations to take serious pre uh, precautions when using them. Later on, uh, just before we came out to DEF CON, as Josh already mentioned, the first essentially safety recall of a medical device without demonstrated proof of harm. No patients had to die. So after this, what went almost unnoticed in the press, after the big splashy stuff, um, is that Hospira reported themselves that they found new vulnerabilities in their devices. So in January, the ICS CERT released a notification that said, Hospira has identified these things. Um, they are, uh, in some cases, vulnerabilities in existing devices. In some cases, vulnerabilities in devices that they no longer sell. Uh, and in these cases, they have patches available. In other cases, here's what to do to avoid the vulnerability. So this is an instance where, uh, on their own, and in a self-reporting format, they took their own initiative to go and do it. Now, that wasn't because they got threatened with a talk at Black Hat. It wasn't because someone was gonna go full disclosure on them. It was some of the quiet work that had been done to build trust in that ecosystem uh, and to specifically get them on that pathway of saying, all right, well, we can't avoid the fact that we have vulnerabilities. We now must address that and embrace it and get on this pathway to getting them fixed faster. So I don't know anyone from Hospira. If anybody is here from Hospira, come up and say hello later. Uh, but it seems like they might be on a very good path going forward, uh, which is great. Another thing that we talked about last year, uh, we did a uh, very small private event uh, up in one of the suites here on Thursday night last year. Uh, we had about 25 or 30 people. Um, it was representatives of the security research community, medical device makers, healthcare organizations, government, uh, many, many others who came in, sat, and talked amongst themselves very quietly, very openly and honestly, um, not really hiding anything or covering anything up. Uh, it was to the point where we had no non-disclosure agreements. We had no agreement to be off the record or Chatham House rule. It was just a bunch of people coming together who saw a common need uh, and a common trajectory and a common desire to do the right thing, collaborating. It's the type of information sharing that's probably intended by uh, information security analysis centers, but that rarely happens in a formalized structure. It's only the type of high trust, high collaboration environment that can engender these types of things. Um, I'd also like to let you know that we're doing it again this year. Um, for better or for worse, looking at the size of the crowd in this room right now, I'm not sure that the space we have can hold everybody, but you're all invited, and if we need to overflow, we'll figure out some way to accommodate it. Take a straw poll. Take a straw poll. Yes. What, what do you mean, take a straw poll? Ask everyone in the room if they're interested in going to this place. Okay. <laughs> I'm afraid the answer that comes back. So, is anybody interested in going to this? Raise your hands. Okay. Yeah, we're gonna need a bigger boat, which is a good thing. Um, it means that this year, more so than last year even, we've got a lot more people come to the table and, uh, and wanting to engage on these things. So if you're interested, uh, come see me, come see Josh, come see Quadi, who's over here, uh, and we can tell you where that's gonna be. What's that? It was magical. It was, yeah, we were gonna sit down for like an hour maybe, and have a bunch of beers. I think maybe half a dozen got, beers got drank and we sat there for five hours and just like talked. It was very, very encouraging, which is why we're doing it again this year. Uh, so in the last 12 months, a lot of things have happened. First one I wanna highlight is uh, De December 5th, right after the, um, the NHI SAC uh, security and privacy meeting up in Boston, we held something called CyberMedRx. Uh, and we did this in order to bring a bunch of the stakeholders together who wouldn't normally talk to each other, get them in a room together, cage match, you know, all of them enter and only one leaves. No, uh, we did it in a very uh, collaborative manner. So it was a, a really cool layout that we did. 
Um, we essentially set the tone in the morning and said, we've got some hard problems to solve, but it's a worthy, worthwhile cause, so let's get to work. Then over the course of, uh, of the day, we had lightning talks and stakeholders from, I think, 18 different groups, we gave them two minutes, five minutes. Who are you? What's your role in the ecosystem? What are your hopes, dreams, and aspirations, as well as your fears, if you get it wrong? Uh, and what can you give? And what do you need in return? And we had those people go and, and essentially identify themselves and say what they do, why they matter. And it, it was a very powerful message to get out there. So people who had been working on the opposite side of the aisle of some of these folks for years and years and years, but had never really sat down and understood what they did, why they did it, and that they were all pointed in the same direction towards patient safety, finally got the chance to come together and see what that looked like, see what it looked like in practice, uh, and to build some of those connections that otherwise wouldn't have been built, uh, and to empathize a little bit with the position that the other folks were in. So you had uh, medical device makers coming and saying, you know, here's what we do, and God, if it weren't for all these standards and things that we have to follow, of course we could do those things. They would be easy. Um, then we had people coming up like healthcare delivery organizations saying, well, look, we get these bad medical devices. I think one of the quotes from a, a different talk was, it's the same crappy software that's in your Windows machine uh, in life and death situ situations. Uh, and then you had people like Marie Mo, who we saw earlier, a photo of her, and I know she's watching the live stream now, say, I'm a patient and I'm a security researcher. I depend on a medical device to live. So I don't care if it's crappy software, it needs to be improved. Um, I don't care what needs to happen. Uh, I need this device uh, in order to, to survive my day to day life. With all the flaws it has, it has way more benefits. So we need to consider all of those types of things. And the uh, the mass of getting those people together, the gravitational pull that they had, um, made it a really, really productive event to the point where somebody who's been in healthcare for like 25 or 30 years, who's, who's crusty by now, who's uh, hardened against any progress, said, wow, that was one of the best events that I've been to. That really opened my eyes. So I think we're seeing a lot of progress by getting people together in the right room. And so we're actually gonna repeat this. Uh, we got an invitation from the Dutch government to come over and run one of these in The Hague. Uh, tentatively, we've got a date set for October 10th. Uh, so anybody who is in Europe around October-ish, um, let us know. We can, we can see if, uh, how we can get you to that. Also, we're going to do another one. I think the date is December 7th. Um, I, I didn't fact check it before I came up here. December 7th? Okay. We got confirmation. There we go. So December 7th, again in Boston, again it's going to follow the NHI SAC or, or the HEMS privacy, HEMS privacy and Security Group. Um, so this is going to happen again. Watch this space, cybermedrx.org. Another big thing that happened, uh, we previewed this a little bit earlier on today. In January, uh, just alongside the uh, FDA workshop that happened, we released the Hippocratic Oath for Connected Medical Devices. The idea here is that physicians take a symbolic oath uh, to act in the best interest of their patients. Increasingly, medical devices are the care delivery instrument. They're the ones carrying out uh, the orders of the physician. So they should also have some type of a symbolic ethos, right? Um, this is meant to be it. Uh, we also wrote it so that anyone in the care delivery ecosystem can see their own role reflected in this. Right? So physicians can read the Hippocratic Oath for Connected Medical Devices and say, oh, I see, I do this, 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 and this. I have a role to play. Medical device makers, biomed, healthcare IT, hospital administrators, patients even, they can look at this and feel like it's talking to them. Uh, this is modeled loosely on our five-star uh, cyber safety framework for automobiles. Um, the five core ingredients here are uh, safety by design. How do you make a product safely and securely? It is third party collaboration. How do you tell, take help from uh, people in the ecosystem who find problems and report them to you? Um, how do you have some type of evidence capture? We routinely hear that no one has ever died from a healthcare hack or from a car hack. 
But the truth is we don't know. We don't have the evidence to say one way or another. Um, how do you contain and isolate failure? And in the healthcare context, uh, we made it very specific. How do you avoid harm from failure? Things like fail-safes. Uh, and in medical devices, this is very common, where you have a physical fail-safe, where even if somebody has uh, the administrator password to the medical device, they can't cause harm. Um, and then finally, how do you update once you know a better way? So it's five very simple capabilities here that uh, many people within the ecosystem can have some role in and can have control of uh, that allows us to have safer devices. Um, the FDA post-market guidance for cybersecurity of medical devices was published in January, and there was a workshop following the publication that was really, really good. Um, Suzanne will talk a little bit about that, and I don't want to steal her thunder, but very briefly, I want to mention that um, the post-market guidance essentially has a carrot-shaped stick, or a stick-shaped carrot, if you will, <laughs> helping to set the incentives for medical device makers, for healthcare delivery organizations, and for others um, to, uh, to, to make a big effort to engage the security research community. So without going into the details of this, essentially one of the requirements in order to reduce costs once you know that there's a flaw is that you have the ability to take um, a vulnerability report from researchers, that you have some type of a coordinated vulnerability disclosure program in place already, and that you're sharing this type of information, you're actively seeking to get the information to make your products better. Um, even though this is not a, a law, uh, even though it's not a regulatory requirement, it's certainly being treated as a regulatory requirement by a lot of the manufacturers. And uh, I was at a medical device conference in Virginia the other day, uh, and every single medical device maker I talked to either has a coordinated vulnerability disclosure program or they are about to release one. So without saying who it was in the room, uh, my informal survey of the six to eight people who were there says that every single one of them is thinking about this. Now this is the type of change that as researchers we would never be able to drive, right? If we're on the outside knocking on the door and saying, hey, let us in, it's not gonna happen. But by teaming up with those medical device makers, with healthcare organizations, with the FDA, the ecosystem is able to make those types of sea changes that will make the world safer. I want to talk a little bit about something that um, you heard a little bit about this morning in Karen's talk. Uh, if you haven't seen that, I encourage you to go back and watch the recording of it. Um, she talked a little bit about a software bill of materials. Uh, the idea is uh, when you go get a car uh, or when you go get a toy, you know what the materials list is that's in that. So when there's a defective part of that car, somebody can go and, and recall it very quickly and safely. So in the automotive industry, for instance, every bolt, every rivet can be traced back to every plant, every facility, every week it was manufactured, so that when something happens, it can really quickly trace it and find out what vehicles are affected, right? So while we're... Um, doing and seeking these things in, uh, in some very, very uh, easy to reach places. Um, we're not doing it in software, which is trivially easy to do. You can run a simple software script and figure out what parts of open source software and commercial code exist in your medical device or in your software package. Um, the manufacturers certainly know what code is in their devices, or I would hope that they know, um, yet we're not doing it and we're not we're not publishing it. Well, Philips took the step uh, and said, okay, we'll do that. We can publish a bill of materials of what's in our software. So now, when a hospital is buying a device, they know what vulnerabilities exist in it that are publicly known. So if, for instance, heart bleed exists in a device that you buy today, you can say, I'm not gonna get that device until you fixed heart bleed. That's a major thing that I need out of my environment. Also, five years down the line, when the next heart bleed comes out, those same hospitals can very quickly, with just a SQL query, rather than uh, an exhaustive port scan of all of their systems, figure out which of their medical devices, which of their systems, has a heart bleed-like vulnerability. 
If we had this, for instance, in uh, electronic medical record systems, and we knew that half of them have a JBoss vulnerability that is actively being exploited by ransomware and that's shutting down hospitals, instead of having the response be, well, let's see if we get ransomware and then let's try and pay the ransom, it would be, let's eliminate this vulnerability. It's posing a serious threat to patient safety. Today, that capability is hard. It's very, very easy, however, to unlock that. And Philips has taken the first step. They're the first medical device maker that I know of to say we will issue a bill of materials uh, for the products that we make. Is that public? There's one other that's about to. Um, Johnson & Johnson, uh, I think they're the biggest medical device maker in the world. Biggest, yeah, biggest medical device maker in the world. They now join the other uh, medical device makers that have a coordinated vulnerability disclosure program. This one follows the ISO framework, by the way. So applause for ISO, uh, which one is that? 3111, 29147? ISO 29147, vulnerability handling, uh, vulnerability disclosure. Yes, if you want to know anything about ISO, no. Uh, Katie Mazuris, who's in the audience, helped uh, develop those standards. She's one of the co-editors, co-authors of the standards. Um, that essentially, it's a, a root kit into the established processes of many, many manufacturers who know ISO. And if there's something you can point to in ISO, they'll just go do it, right? <laughs> I know, I know, it seems crazy, but, uh, but if you can do that, uh, then now they have a way to engage and to actually build a secure uh, coordinated vulnerability program. Um, Jen talked about this a little bit earlier, uh, but uh, there was a HHS task force established to look at healthcare cybersecurity as a part of a legislative act. Literally, there's an act of Congress that says, get together a bunch of people, 20 different stakeholders representing multiple stakeholder groups, one of whom... Uh, one of those stakeholder groups, by the way, named in this act that passed through Congress is security researchers. So Congress is getting clueful and saying, we need security researchers to be a part of this dialogue if we're going to talk about security research type things. Kind of makes sense. We all know it. But uh, getting that level of awareness into the legislators' minds um, is a real accomplishment. So uh, two of the people out of those 20, one of them is sitting here, Josh Corman, um, who represents the security research community there. The other, Mike McNeil, works for Philips, who's a very, very clueful individual. He spoke earlier on a panel here. He's the one who's pushed through a coordinated vulnerability disclosure program with Philips, as well as the software bill of materials that they've got. So uh, I've got high hopes for uh, what might come out of that. Um, expect disruption come you know, March 2017 timeframe. Looking ahead, uh, and I'll speed up because I'm looking ahead to getting some great pe people come up here. Uh, in October 2016, the DMCA will have certain exceptions come into effect. One of those is you will now be able to reverse engineer medical devices. That's a pretty cool thing. So up until now, if you took a medical device and you tried to reverse engineer the protocols it was using or any of the software or firmware in there, it would have been illegal under the D Digital Millennium Copyright Act. Um, one of the people who is a signatory to this Harvard publication, a letter uh, campaign, actually, to uh, the Librarian of Congress, is in the back of the room now. He'll be up here later, Jay Radcliffe. Uh, because of his work, as well as some of the others, uh, including Jen Ellis, who might have walked out of the room, um, now we have exemptions for things like medical devices for cars and for uh, voting machines where we can look at the security of these critical areas uh, to find out what flaws exist before the bad guys do in a legal way. Uh, I'll skip this one for now and we might talk about it tomorrow uh, when we're talking about some very hard problems and very hard approaches. So now I want to call up to the stage and I'll grab the mic for them. Um, We'll have a handful of people come up and give their perspectives. Uh, a U.S. regulator, Suzanne Schwartz of the FDA. Uh, Colin Morgan, who is uh, product, and secu product security coordinator for uh, Johnson & Johnson. Jay Radcliffe, works for Rapid7 as a security researcher. 
and Christian Damef, who is a, uh, both a security conscious person who has spoken at DEF CON and a physician. So first, let me introduce Suzanne Schwartz of the FDA to give a bit of her perspective. And you can just advance the slides. Can everybody hear me? Yes, 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 yes. So thank you very much. I have to apologize in advance because I'm gonna use some notes here. I'm limited in terms of time and I really felt it was important to get this right. I have a few personal messages to say here and um, again, I just wanted to make sure that I was able to convey my sentiments in a, in a concise manner but in a very meaningful way. So um, let me just start off by saying that I feel very reflective today and highly appreciative. Last August, I was privileged to participate by phone, by calling into this particular session. And I don't know if you remember, but I stated at that time that I was hopeful to be able to participate in person this coming year, this year. And here I am, and here I am because of the outstanding work of Bo Woods, Josh Corman, and the entire I Am the Cavalry team who live by the credo of safer sooner together. Being here provides for me a study really in contrasts and I might add really stark contrast from our medical device ecosystems really state of being when I compare that to even three years ago, three or more years ago, and to where we are currently. And that's not to say that we should be patting ourselves on the back um, or lapsing into any sense of complacency. We do have a lot of work ahead of us. This is an arduous journey. But the steps that have already taken, we've taken over the past few years really give me hope. They give me hope that with persistence, working together, we're going to continue to improve and there will come that moment when these baby steps will be transformative into more, into greater strides as we move towards what really is a desired state of medical device cybersecurity. So kind of picture this, in 2013, 2014, that really was an inflection point for the agency, for the FDA, as well as, I would say, for the medical device community. Prior to that time, you know, live demos of medical device exploits and dropping O-days on the stage of whether it was Black Hat or DEF CON, it was really rather the norm, and it was very much anticipated by attendees, by the participants. On the other hand, FDA, medical device manufacturers, healthcare delivery organizations, in other words, our ecosystem, the healthcare ecosystem, we were first learning about these vulnerabilities and their potential for exploit at the same time as the public at large. Now, that's not a great trajectory, as you can well imagine. When it's, especially when you view that through the lens of patients who rely upon these technologies to really to better their lives. But this year, by contrast, a number of panels at B-Sides, Black Hat, and Codonomicon are living proof that when all stakeholders are given the opportunity to have a voice, a voice that's heard and that's not ignored, and are given a seat at the table, an equal seat at the table, we can better understand and appreciate each other's perspectives, our motivations, needs, as well as interests, and, and collectively, we're in a much stronger position to address the tough challenges that plague healthcare security's posture as we continue to evolve, as we are evolving right now. It's worth noting that we don't get to showcase a panel of diverse stakeholders like today conversing on this topic unless there's already been an investment in the hard foundational work, the dedication, the tenacious commitment 
to being collaborative and developing that unity of effort. Now, and dare I say, I think we've unglued ourselves from being stuck in that very alluring, admiring the problem phase as a community, and Bo knows what I'm talking about. I'll be very interested in hearing your perspective on that. So how did we get here? The answer I would offer is really through a coalition of the willing. Um, individuals and organizations who've shown courage by moving out of the comfort zone of their own silos and therefore seeking, thereby seeking a common purpose. That being to protect patients against potential harm as patients place their trust and confidence in the very technologies that are supposed to help them. So this past January, here, let's just switch this slide. Okay, yes, okay. As Bo mentioned, this past January, the FDA, together with HHS, with Department of Homeland Security, as well as with the NHISAC, the National Healthcare ISAC, we convened a public workshop, bringing really all stakeholders together to further expand the depth and the breadth of collaborative efforts in medical device security. And this workshop was held on the heels of releasing the draft guidance that Bo referenced on post-market management of medical device cybersecurity. So I've selected a few of the murals that represent the panel sessions to share with you. And as you can see, some of the very important themes that emerge, the need to embody empathy and to identify shared principles understanding motivations, the importance of building trust relationships as a vehicle for coordinated disclosure, and understanding that progress here will happen incrementally and is contingent upon a change in mindset, change in behavior, and ultimately a change in culture. Now, okay. transparency, and communication throughout the total product life cycle is critical. What does security testing of devices look like? What is considered acceptable risk? What forces exist to empower and to better inform the customer before purchasing decisions are made? Again, ultimately, patient safety is centric. and to enhance situational awareness. Developing trust circles is what's going to enable actionable information sharing on risks, threats, and cyber practices. But how do we get to establish those trust circles? Well, we have to be able to speak a common language and share an understanding of our respective pain points, what constraints different stakeholders have, what hurdles that they face. So the Cavalry's Hippocratic Oath lays out a blueprint for advancing medical device security, recognizing that, no, this doesn't happen overnight. I mean, to paraphrase Josh Corman, you got to learn to crawl and then walk before you can run. And with that, I'm going to turn this back to Bo and close by saying that we aspire to be your running partners in this great journey, safer, sooner, and together. All right, thank you, Suzanne. Um, next up is gonna be Colin Morgan, and I'm gonna jump out of the presentation for just a second, uh, because he's got a, an intro video that I think you will want to see. Uh-oh. All right, let's try this. Uh, we'll see if the audio comes out. Well, this is my dad's job, and he's really superhero. That's awesome. That he saves people's lives by making sure no bad guys get into any medicine machines to hurt other people. <laughs> all right. So first of all. Let's hear it for Irish. 
Uh, and secondly, I'll pass the mic over to Colin to give uh, medical device maker perspective. Thanks, Bo. Uh, first, it's an honor to be here. You know, I've, uh, first time I've spoken at B-Sides. And I mean, how cool is that? What parent doesn't want their kid calling them a superhero? <laughs> it, what was the amazing part was I explained to him probably months before that, you know, what I did for work. Because my wife stays home. She has her own, own consulting businesses. But every day, it's, it's dad's going to work to earn money for the family, and he's working really hard. And I'm a big family guy. So one day, my son asked me, what is it that you do? And I explained to him that I work in cybersecurity, and I've got this new fun role where I get to take what we've learned in IT security and try to bring it to a world that doesn't understand it. And he's like, well, what does that actually mean? I'm like, well, you know how people get sick. And sometimes they have to go to the hospital, or sometimes they wear devices that help heal them. He's like, yes, Dad, I get that. Well, I try to make sure that no bad guys get into them and break them and hurt them. And his first response was, why are they able to do that? And then it was, why would somebody want to do that? And I've really thought about that messaging a lot over the past few years. And there's a couple points that I want to touch on in this brief five minutes that I have here. And uh, I'm open to any questions afterwards as well. I'm uh, as much of an open book as I can be. Um, but I will preface with the obligatory, these are my opinions and not those of Johnson & Johnson. My attorneys make me say things like that. But Johnson & Johnson, that's where I work. And for those who don't know Johnson & Johnson, and when you hear about it, you think of babies. You think of Johnson's baby, you think of you know, cute, cuddly faces. But what a lot of people don't know is that Johnson & Johnson is made up of 200, over 250 companies across 60 countries across the world, about 130,000 employees, and we touch 1 billion patients a day. 1 billion. We have products that range from over-the-shelf over the things like Tylenol and Listerine to pharmaceutical products for rheumatoid arthritis or cancer and medical devices such as sterilization systems, insulin pumps, and many future ones that are going to be coming. So we are a very diverse healthcare organization that touches 1 billion patients per day. So here I am joining j, &J five years ago and coming to a realization of what the security world looks like in healthcare. Mostly my background was in the federal government, which is a whole different umbrella, which, you know, Suzanne touched on some of that. <clears throat> and after a few years in the organization, really understanding the breadth of the company, I uh, had my aha moment around this space. And it was when I first met Josh at AppSec New York City a few years back, where he talked about I Am The Cavalry. And I went up to him afterwards and was like, hey, I work at J&J, &J, and apparently we're the largest medical device company in the world, and I'd like to learn more about what you're, uh, what you're talking about. So fast forward a few years, fast forward through a lengthy investigation into our organization of understanding what we have in our inventory today, what our future pipeline is gonna be, having all of those tough conversations, the political battles, and the challenges that we faced, we now have a dedicated program focused on this. We went from a simple idea from a conversation with I Am The Cavalry to a full-fledged program dedicated to securing our products engineers that sit on the product development teams building security in. Things that all of us think, this just makes sense. I'm a security person, this, we should be doing this. The world is different, and Suzanne hit on a, a key word that has really been one that's been resonating with me lately, and that's culture. Two years ago at the FDA public workshop in 2014, there was a cultural issue within the security community and the healthcare community around, this, is this really an issue? We've, Zoomed past that in the past two years, where the public workshop this year, everybody understood the issues. And the questions were more around, how do we solve them? So the cultural issue is not in InfoSec. The cultural issue is outside of InfoSec. The cultural issue is with the R&D organizations, the quality organizations, the teams that develop these amazing life-saving products, but now slap on some type of Bluetooth or RF or network stack and now all of a sudden they have to become a infosec or IT expert and that's not what they are. And they operate in a realm where security has never historically been part of. Where quality sits within a quality process and they have to follow the process. But when you look inside the process, security is not mentioned once. And so you have to go through that effort to change that process. And that's a really big cultural battle and challenge that every medical device company, every hospital has to battle through. And we're fighting through those challenges. And we've had a number of wins and a number of, of uh, um, you know, successes that we're very proud of. You know, we've heard about one today as our vulnerability disclosure one, productsecurity.jnj.com, which was a significant, significant accomplishment for us. It took many months of effort getting the right support and buy-in from everybody who would impact it. You know, I mentioned we have 265 operating companies. All of our franchises are independent of one another. They don't talk to each other. 
we're a security team that spans all of them and have to, have to go have the same conversation with every single team at different times. And it's just the nature of our business, and we've had to really adapt and create flexible models. Number two is the crowdsourcing piece. We have crowdsourced the crap out of our framework. We didn't go into a bubble and say, this is how we're going to build devices securely. We went outside. We talked to I'm the Cavalry. We talked to our, our competition because, you know, the medical device companies, we don't compete on security. We talked to the government. We talked to researchers. We really tried to understand the approaches people have taken to build a solid program, or what we think is solid. You know, we focus on the NIST cybersecurity framework. We focus on the ISO standards that, you know, that Katie authored over here for our vulnerability disclosure. We looked at TIR 57, which recently came out around risk management from a cybersecurity perspective. And we've really tried to figure out how we take a lot of these, build it into a program that fits into a quality process that doesn't understand security. Because if we go into that process with something brand new, it's going to be hard for them to understand it. So we have to do a lot of language translation, which Josh talked about this morning. Really take what we talk about in security and put it into their language and their speak. So when we talk about threats, to them that's a hazard. And we need to talk about it that way. And we've really tried to adopt that internally to help buy that support. The fourth one is community. We're working on some community projects, or what we call them. Uh, one, we, we talked about it a bit at the NHISAC event and have really started some movement on it, and that's trying to open source within the healthcare community our framework. So what we're doing for threat modeling, what we're doing for security requirements, how we're building out our assessment questionnaires, and sharing that with the greater good of the healthcare world. So using the NHISAC as a forum to pass that through to the other organizations. You know, for, for most that don't know, 80% of the medical device companies that are out there have 50 or fewer employees. 50 or fewer. Now, how many of them do you think are dedicated or understand security? They're the ones that need help. And if we can help them, we're going to do the best that we can. Uh, so finally, and I try not to run too long here, is, is, you know, back to my son's video there. He talks about, he called me a superhero. I'm not a superhero. I'm just a guy in a company trying to do the right thing trying to make our devices safer and secure. I mean, if I want to throw a term around, I'll steal one of Josh's and maybe call myself and my team super change agents, because that's ultimately what we are. We're security guys. I'm a tech guy by trade. I used to love breaking network equipment. And now I get to try to change and work to change culture in the largest medical device company in the world that touches one billion patients per day. And to me, that's exciting and empowering, because I feel like every day I'm making a difference. So thank you for the opportunity, and uh, I appreciate it. Thank you very much, Colin. So next up, uh, we'll go to Jay Radcliffe, who will make the long walk from the back of the, the room, where all the cool kids sit, up to the very front. I don't think anybody's shocked that I would be in the back of the room, right? So it's been a really interesting kind of journey uh, in looking at the research that I've done and what it, kind of, what it kind of means to me. As a security researcher and as an IT professional, I started out this just by playing around with something, playing around with my medical device to see what happened and to see what it would do. And at the time that I did that, I didn't really think anything of it. And it turns out that it's become a very large issue, and it's a very important issue. And watching the last hour here and seeing all the progress that this group has made and seeing all the progress that we have made collectively as a community by building something where manufacturers have a stake and they're saying, yes, we want to do this. Individuals are pushing up from the bottoms of their companies saying, this is something that's really important. This is something that I really believe in that we need to do. Pushing on the media areas so that way executives get the idea of, yes, this is something that's important. It's not something that we can hide from. It is something that we can do something about. Five years ago, when I kickstarted this, there was a lot of hiding. <laughs> nobody had a plan, nobody knew what to do. And as a consultant, I have this great insight because people call our company up and they have us help them out in this. And they ask us, all right, we've got executive approval. Uh, you know, we have a, a huge hospital and we, uh, we hired one person and we gave them $5,000 and we want them to secure everything. <laughs> Can you please help us do that? And that's really where we're kind of at right now. We have an excited top end of the branch 
that can give us limited resources that want something done, and we have people at the bottom that want something done and don't have the resources to do it. So we're in this execution stage. And I look at some of the slides that Suzanne presented about the life cycle and the communication and things about that, and that's great, and I love that we have a plan to do that. And every time I think about a plan, and if that plan worked great, we wouldn't have any problems, I think about a quote from Mike Tyson. And Mike Tyson says, everybody's got a plan until they get punched in the face. <laughs> and a lot of times, that's where I, I feel that I'm at, and I know that other people in my industry are at. We've got a great plan. We go into an organization. They want help. They're very cooperative. They want to do it. We start the plan, and something goes wrong. Somebody disagrees. Somebody doesn't want to cooperate. And what's really important right now is for us to stay engaged in that process. We can't get frustrated and we can't quit at that point in time. We have to stay engaged in the process and continue to move forward. Sometimes when I present research to a company, it doesn't go real well. <laughs> they don't like it. But you know what? I smile and I say, hey, Let's try and work through this. How can I help do this better? How can I help you understand? Do I have to do it in a different way? Do I need to talk to different people? I try and stay engaged not to get a sour taste in my mouth and say, you know what? Screw it. It's not worth it. This can't be fixed, which we tend to do in InfoSec, right? We are frustrated because we want change now. But we have to stay engaged because we're talking about something that doesn't move fast. We can't get funding the way we want to get funding. So everybody from the top to the bottom needs to stay engaged so we continue to execute on these things and make that continuous progress because it's amazing the amount that we've already got done, but we really aren't done yet. And as a patient, as a practitioner, as somebody that you know, often watches, I want to see that succeed. I want to see it get better. So I think that that's kind of where I've seen things go, and that's where I see a lot of places at. Everybody wants patients to be safer. Everybody wants medical devices to be safe. There isn't a medical device company or healthcare provider that I've ever been with that was like, you know what, screw the patients. Um, <laughs> it, it, live, die, whatever, we're here for a profit. None of them say that. Number one priority for every one of these companies is taking care of people. How do we just do that effectively and how do we integrate that into the information and technology ecosphere is what's important. And the people in this room, the people at these conferences are the ones that know how to do that the best. And we have to interact with them and we have to continue to do that. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Jay. So we often say that uh, security is a relay race sometimes, uh, and you're always passing the torch on to the next guy. Well, the running uh, anchor leg of our relay race is Christian Damaf, uh, who, as I mentioned, is both a physician uh, and a DEF CON speaker. So over to you. Thank you so much. Hey, everyone, can we just get it lively in here a little bit. Can we give it up for I Am The Calvary, for everyone that's spoken here, all the governmental organizations, all of you guys that are here learning or contributing or going to, just give it up to them. Come on, everybody, give it up. <laughs> all right, so my job here is in about four to five minutes is to teach you two things about doctors and remind you about something very, very important. The first thing I'm going to teach you about doctors is that 99.999% .99 of them know nothing about what you know, okay? And it's not because they don't care. It's not because they haven't heard about it on the news. It's because for the most part, they're very, very busy. Furthermore, it's just not in their purview. Something that was very impactful to me last time we had our meeting, and I hope all of you come on Thursday, was that someone asked me, you're telling me that when you go and order a drug and that drug is being delivered to that patient and it's a life-saving drug that you don't even look at that machine. You don't look at the stickers that are on it. You don't know how it works. You don't know what its name is. You don't know if it has a horrible track record. You don't know if it doesn't work. I said, absolutely, I have no idea. 
I put that order on a computer. It goes to a nurse that's in a room 200 feet from me. That medicine gets pulled out of the pharmacy and gets infused in that patient, and I know nothing else about it. Frankly, for the most part, if I'm not running around the emergency department with my hair on fire, I don't know if that drug's even been given. Now, that's very different probably from your day-to-day, -day, which is you're familiar with the technical tools that you use. They're like your third arm. Everyone in here has so many different devices on them that are part of their everyday life. That is not what happens in medicine. Okay? So the first thing to teach you is that doctors, for the most part, know nothing about what you know. Now, if you have been paying attention today, you know that is not where we should be. Okay? One of the stakeholders that needs to be part of this conversation are healthcare providers. Nurses, physicians, doctors, nurse practitioners, physician assistants, everyone in the care delivery, from the janitors all the way to the, patient, to the doctors that are doing life-saving surgery. Okay? They need to be part of it. Not all of them. We don't need to have courses in medical school about cybersecurity. Excuse the cyber. And you see to throw something at me if you want, but we have to use it, I guess. It's not going to happen, and it doesn't have to happen. But we need to engage some of them, because what they offer is a very valuable part of the conversation. Okay? The second thing I'm going to teach you about doctors is that they're hackers, too. They just don't know it. They just don't know it. Let's talk about this. What do they do? They look at a system, the human body, and they recognize where it breaks. They recognize when it breaks down and it causes cancer, it causes infectious disease, the trauma associated with a high impact motor vehicle collision. They recognize that your spleen's not working because you're bleeding to death. It's been fractured in half. That system that is supposed to work is not going to work, and this is where it's failing. This is what I'm going to do to intervene it. This is what I'm going to patch, okay? But that's kind of more, oh, well, everyone just patches. How's that really the hacker ethos? Well, physicians implement treatments to circumvent disease. That's exactly what we do every day. We recognize that there are ways around problems, and we think innovatively. We see where these vulnerabilities are, and we attack them, we fix them, etc. Doctors do the same thing with their treatments. They recognize that cancer, it, it, some cancers work a certain way. They involve certain genes. Uh, they recognize that chemotherapy will work for some of them. Radiation will work for some of them. A combination of it. They figure out the problem, and they fix it. Okay? They recognize what's broken, just like you guys out there. So take that understanding when you try to engage them. Say, unlock that hacker within that healthcare provider. Talk to them about the system of care and, and say, put it in their... Put it in their purview. Say, what would happen if that machine broke over there? That machine that's delivering a very potent medication that's keeping that very sick patient alive. What would happen if it broke? Well, the patient would die. Do you care about that? Of course. Doctors care about that. Everyone cares about that. Well, that device that we're talking about is incredibly vulnerable to attack. Let me show you how. And let me show you with just a little bit of work, a little bit of effort, how someone with a very, very bad um, spirit, soul, I'm not a very religious person myself, but that person can screw that up, can hurt your patient. And all of a sudden, they're going to care about it. Okay? And they might not care about it to say, oh, I'm going to go and take some coursework on um, cybersecurity, I'm going to learn about this and be able to contribute meaningful to the technical conversation. But what they will be are advocates for you in the conversation with the people who can change this. And for the reason of the last thing, I'm going to remind you that this is why. I'm thankful for the opportunity to speak here with you, but I want to make sure that all of this conference, all of this talk, all these tracks, we talk about all these awesome things that are happening. We cannot forget why. Why there are so many people in this room that care. All right? It's because of that tiny little infant that's seven days old that's surrounded by ins insurmountable odds. If you can look around that, look at one, two, three, four, five infusion pumps, all of which have drug libraries that are reminiscent of the Hospera hack. Telemetry units, drug delivery systems, ventilators, 
that breathe for this tiny little infant. Okay? They already have the disease, the breakdown in their physiological processes that they're fighting against. The last thing they need is for one of these systems to fail because it's win running Windows NT. And no one's looked at it for 10 years. And the vendors have forgotten about it. And the biomed people say it works, it's too expensive to fix it, and we haven't gotten money to do it. We don't have another bolus of money until the next cycle. We're already striving, you know, we're already struggling to take care of the patients we have right now with the medications they need. This is a hard problem, okay? But this is why you're here, hopefully. This is why you're paying attention. It's because you recognize that this is what matters. And let's strip away for a minute the term the patient. That's what I say. I say I see lots of patients every day. I saw patients last night until 2 a.m. And that helps me cope with the fact that sometimes it's hard to think about them as people just because a lot of bad stuff happens to them. Okay? They are people. They are your daughters your sons, your mothers, your grandparents, they're you. And we all know more than anyone else on this planet, this is problems going to get worse. The next generation of doctors grew up with, cell phone, with smartphones glued to their hands. And they see the solution to every single problem out there with, as an app or another medical device. The next generations of doctors and entrepreneurs in the medical sphere are going to push for this even harder. It's going to explode. We recognize that we are not going to be able to fix this problem unless we start doing something now. And it's just the right thing to do. Okay? I really appreciate this time, this opportunity. Again, thank, give it up for the Calvary.